Ukraine says it has liberated three villages in the southeast of the country in the first victories of its much-anticipated counteroffensive. Footage on social media showed Ukrainian troops celebrating in the neighboring settlements of Blahogatne and Naskuchna in the Donetsk region. Kyiv's deputy defense minister said nearby Makarivka was Makarivka was also taken. On Saturday, President Volodymyr Zelensky confirmed that the counteroffensive had begun. These three settlements would be the first liberated since his comments, but not the first that Ukraine has recaptured since Monday, when pockets of its forces began to advance in the country's south. Moscow has yet to confirm the fall of any of the villages, instead speaking of repelling Ukrainian assaults in the region. A military defector who fled Russia on foot has given a rare interview to the BBC, in which he paints a picture of an army suffering heavy losses and experiencing low morale. Lieutenant Dmitry Mishov, a 26-year-old airman, handed himself into the Lithuanian authorities, seeking political asylum. Dmitry said escaping from Russia in such dramatic fashion, with a small rucksack on his back, was his last resort. He is among a small handful of known cases of serving military officers fleeing the country to avoid being sent to Ukraine to fight. Dmitry, an attack helicopter navigator, was based in the Peskov region, in northwestern Russia. When the aircraft started to be prepared for combat, Dmitry sensed a real war was coming, not just drills. He tried to leave the Air Force in January 2022 but his paperwork had not gone through by the time Russia invaded Ukraine on the 24th of February. He was sent to Belarus where he flew helicopters delivering military cargo. Ukraine's President Volodymyr Zelensky appears to have confirmed that his country's long-awaited counter-offensive against Russia has started. Counter-offensive and defensive actions are taking place, he said. But he added that he would not talk in detail about which stage or state the counter-offensive was in. The comments come after an escalation of fighting in the south and east of Ukraine and speculation about progress of the widely anticipated push. Ukrainian troops are reported to have advanced in the east near Bakhmut and in the south near Zaporizhia, and have carried out long-range strikes on Russian targets. But assessing the reality on the front lines is difficult, with the two, the two warring sides presenting contrasting narratives, Ukraine claiming progress and Russia that it is fighting off attacks.
At least 10 people have died and 25 others are in hospital after a wedding bus crashed in an Australian wine region. The passengers were returning from a wedding at a winery on Sunday night in Hunter Valley, a popular spot for wine tourists, when their coach overturned. Police say they have charged the 58-year-old bus driver, but driver, but are yet to disclose the charges. The cause of the crash is unclear. The newlyweds were not on the bus. Police Commissioner Karen Webb said the site of the crash is still an active crime scene. We've got forensics officers processing the crime scene. We've got crash investigation unit officers. We've got rescue officers. The accident occurred around 23.30 local time, 13.30 Greenwich Mean Time, when, according to police, there had been heavy fog in the area. The bus had rolled over while making a turn at a roundabout off a highway. Authorities say the vehicle has now been pulled upright. Around 13,000 people have been evacuated in northeast Philippines as the country's most famous volcano, Mayan, continued to ooze lava. Riding lorries and buffalo-drawn carriages, people living within the permanent danger zone, or six-kilometer radius, fled to shelters. Known for its perfect, conical shape, Mayan started spewing lava last week. But evacuations only began over the weekend as volcanic activity intensified, setting of alerts. More people could be evacuated if Mayan's unrest intensifies in the coming days, said Teresito Bacolcal, the country's chief volcanologist. It is currently under the third highest warning in a five-tier system that forecasts the threat of a hazardous or explosive eruption. It is technically erupting, albeit at a slow pace, with lava oozing from the crater. U.S. billionaire philanthropist George Soros has handed over the running of his $25 billion, 19.9 billion pounds, financial and charitable empire to his son Alex. The Hungarian-born financier said his son had earned it in an interview with the Wall Street Journal. Since the 1990s, the family's wealth has been directed to support democracy building in dozens of countries. But in recent years, the 92-year-old former hedge fund manager has become the focus of anti-Semitic conspiracies. A Soros spokesperson confirmed to the BBC the details of the interview published on Sunday. George Soros is also one of the largest donors to the U.S. Democratic Party. Alex, a 37-year-old history graduate, is the second youngest of his five children.
Former U.S. President Donald Trump has called the federal indictment against him, ridiculous and baseless, in his first public appearance since the charges were announced. A 37-count indictment made public on Friday accuses him of keeping sensitive documents at his Mar-a-Lago property. At two campaign speeches on Saturday, Mr. Trump said the indictment amounted to election interference by the corrupt FBI and Justice Department. He has denied any wrongdoing. Mr. Trump has been charged with mishandling hundreds of classified documents, including some about U.S. nuclear secrets and military plans. The indictment accused keeping the files at his Florida estate Mar-a-Lago, including in a ballroom and a shower. He lied to investigators and tried to obstruct their investigation into his handling of the documents, the indictment alleged. Manchester City's long quest to win the Champions League finally ended in triumph against Inter Milan in Istanbul as Pep Guardiola's side completed the treble. After winning the Premier League and FA Cup, City emulated Manchester United's triple trophy hall in 1999 as they became only the second English club to achieve the feat after Rodri's, Rodri's crisp 68th-minute strike settled an attritional final. Guardiola's all-conquering side were never at their best against a brilliantly organized Inter and had to cope with the loss of Kevin De Bruyne to injury in the first half. But the massed ranks of City fans inside Ataturk Stadium did not care about that as they joyously celebrated the greatest night and season in the club's history. And for Guardiola, it seals his status as one of the managerial greats as he added a third Champions League to the two he won at Barcelona, the last coming in 2011. When 99-year-old Eleuthera Abus lifts her right arm, she winces as the broken bones move. It's been six months since her fall. All I can do is manage her pain, says Elena Yep, the 28-year-old doctor who is examining her on her porch. She really needs to have the bone pinned. But the f*** is refusing to take her to hospital. Eleuthera's daughters are not heartless. They are poor. The nearest surgical facility is hundreds of miles away across the sea from the tiny island of Diet where they live. It's one of a cluster of islands that make up the Agutaya Archipelago, stranded in the middle of the Philippines' Sulu Sea. Sulu sea. For the 13,000 or so people who live here, Dr. Elena, as they call her, is the only doctor. Petite, with glasses and long hair tied back in a ponytail, she always wears a broad smile that masks quiet determination.
when commuters in the city of Kolkata, formerly Calcutta, step aboard India's first underwater train later this year. A Bengal-born British engineer who conceived an unrealized underground railway for the city over a century ago is unlikely to cross their minds. Sir Harley Dalrymple Hay envisioned an ambitious 10.6 kilometers, 6 kilometers, 6.5 miles underground railway with 10 stops and featuring a tunnel beneath the Hooghly River to connect Kolkata with its twin city, Howrah. However, due to insufficient funding and doubts about the geological properties of the city's soil, this grand plan never materialized. Eventually, in October 1984, Kolkata did become the first Indian city to get a metro railway. From just 3.4 kilometers long and five stations, it is today a busy 26-station 31 km network, half of which runs underground. Now in December, the metro will open India's first underwater section that will cross the Hooghly. The city was known far beyond Ukraine's borders for its sparkling wine. The local winery, set up in a huge abandoned gypsum mine in the 1950s, was among the biggest and best producers of the fizzy drink in the USSR and then in independent Ukraine. Its location, about 70 meters below ground, made it easier to achieve the right temperature for the drink to ferment. It is now owned by a company called Art Winery and its marketing director Oleksandra Cherednichenko told the BBC about the first time she visited the vast caves. It was an amazing feeling. It is an underground city so vast that they used proper vehicles to get about, to get about within it, lorries to transport goods, and people used buggies. There were endless rows of bottles, and you couldn't see where they ended. Australia has announced it will introduce a national ban on Nazi symbols in an effort to crack down on far-right groups. Public displays of the swastika or SS symbols will be punishable by up to a year in prison. However, the new laws will not cover the Nazi salute. Nazi symbols are already banned in many states, but this means they won't be allowed anywhere, the government says. The move comes amid a resurgence in far-right activity. In March, a group of neo-Nazis appeared at a rally in Melbourne hosted by Kelly J. Keane Minchel, who is known for her opposition to transgender rights, and performed Nazi salutes on the steps of the Victorian, Victorian Parliament. Ms. Keane Minchel denied any connection to the group, but the event triggered a political backlash with calls for greater efforts to tackle displays of Nazi regalia. There is no place in Australia for symbols that glorify the horrors of the Holocaust, Attorney General Mark Dreyfus said, announcing the new legislation.
Millions of people in North America have been advised to wear N95 masks outdoors due to poor air quality levels sparked by intense wildfires in Canada. New York will begin distributing free masks on Thursday. Canada has said that people should wear a mask if they are unable to remain indoors. Officials warn that the, warn that the dangerously smoky conditions are expected to persist into the weekend. Much of the smoke is coming from Quebec, where 150 fires are burning. More than 15,000 residents are expected to be forced to evacuate in the province, officials said on Wednesday. It is already Quebec's worst fire season on record. New York Governor Kathy Hochul announced on Wednesday that New York would distribute one million masks to state residents on Thursday. Environment Canada has said that conditions are worsening in Toronto on Thursday, as more smoke pours in. In a special weather bulletin on Wednesday, the agency recommended that anyone outdoors wear a mask. Actress Jodie Comer abruptly walked off stage during a Broadway performance on Wednesday after saying she had trouble breathing due to wildfire smoke. Comer's one-woman show, Prima Facie, continued after her understudy stepped in to complete the performance. Canada wildfire smoke has blanketed New York City in recent days. A performance of Hamilton and several sports matches were postponed on Wednesday as residents were advised to stay indoors or wear N95 masks outside. Today's matinee of Prima Facie was halted approximately 10 minutes into the performance after Jody Comer had difficulty breathing due to the poor air quality in New York City because of smoke from, of smoke from the Canadian wildfires, a spokesperson for the production told The Hollywood Reporter. The audience member told Deadline that after about three minutes into her performance, Comer coughed and called out to a stage manager, I can't breathe this air. Donald Trump has been told he faces a criminal investigation over the handling of classified files after he left Washington, U.S. media report. A move by federal prosecutors to notify the ex-president of a criminal probe suggests he could soon face his charges. If that happened, it would be the second indictment of Mr. Trump, who is, cam who is campaigning once again to be president. Prosecutors have been looking into the transfer of files to Mr. Trump's mar a lago Florida estate since last year. The beachside property was searched last August and 11,000 documents were seized, including around 100 marked as classified. Some of these were labeled top secret. In an interview on Wednesday, Mr. Trump denied he had been told he faces an indictment over his handling of the documents. When asked by the New York Times if he had been told he is a target of a federal investigation, he said, you have to understand that he was not in direct touch with prosecutors.
Former U.S. Vice President Mike Pence has offered his most forceful repudiation of Donald Trump to date during a speech launching his 2024 campaign. The Republican accused Mr. Trump of being unfaithful to the U.S. Constitution and of abandoning conservative values. The former Indiana governor and congressman formally commenced his White House campaign on Wednesday. The move pits him against his two-time running mate, who he served under in the White House from 2017 to 21. At a speech in Ankeny, Iowa, Mr. Pence argued that Mr. Trump had encouraged the mob that attacked the U.S. Capitol on 6 January 2021 and had incorrectly asserted that Mr. Pence had the power to overturn the election result. The American people deserve to know that on that day, President Trump also demanded that I choose between him and the Constitution. I believe that anyone who puts themselves over the Constitution should never be President of the United States.